afterwards, he pulled me, Steve Whitmire pulled me aside and said, hey, you were really good in there. Uh, do you want to do this again? I said, yes, yes. <laughs> what are you going to yes. say, no? <laughs> and later, um, I get an email uh, asking, hey, do you want to work? Um, we, we have this movie coming up. Do you want to work on it? Yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> Welcome back to Puppeteers. We're your hosts, Adam Krutinger and Cameron Garrity. And today on the show, we have the uncomparable Chase Woolner. Welcome to the show, buddy. It's about time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Been on the show since the start and uh, the inception of the idea. Right. Well, we've we've been a fan of you since before the show started. A uh, good friend of ours, Chase Wolner. Uh, you know him from all sorts of projects, um, such as the um, the 2011 Muppets movie, uh, the 2015 Muppet Show. He has his own studio, Busy Hands, uh, and he's an artist and educator. And we are so excited to have him to talk to us. Uh, Chase Wolner, welcome to Puppet Tears. Thank you so much. <laughs> so uh, before we get into the thick of it, what are you working on right now? Well, um, I'm, I'm very excited about uh, the next six months or so. I just took the uh, jump to be a full-time work-for-myself artist uh, in that, uh, you know, I just moved from Los Angeles to Michigan um, and purchased a home and got married in the backyard. So my wife and I, we jumped from uh, California to Michigan where we purchased a home with a pottery studio and we're making the jump to full-time artists. Wow. That's so, uh... Whereas previously I was a full-time uh, teacher as well as a uh, puppeteer in los angeles that's amazing what made you uh decide to move was it mostly like real estate and being able to get more space or i'm sure it was a handful of reasons there's so many reasons i think the main reason uh the primary at front of mind is uh, climate change one of the things with living in los angeles and um was nervousness uh living and renting in los angeles nervousness about natural disasters, uh, earthquakes. Uh, I was tired of fire days. I spent the last year and a half with really terrible allergies, probably because of fires. Um, so much so that my face would swell up and stuff. So oh we made the jump to uh, Michigan, which has potentially, uh, you know, access to fresh water over the next 50 years. And um, a place where we are able to purchase property where for me uh, at this point in my life, uh, purchasing property in California, anywhere in California or up the coast is not attainable for me. You could barely point. rent a trash can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. I tried. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, not to mention even with especially the mar housing market now, I mean, it was insane pricing before all this and now it's even it's yeah. even more like yeah never i mean not only that too like even like like because my parents moved from from buffalo to california close to 10 years ago now and like when they they paid like double for their house and not only did they pay double for it in california but they got half the house Half the amount of house. Oh, 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 half the amount of space. The house was much bigger in Buffalo. Half the price. It was right. It was half the size in California, but double the price. So, and again, it's it's all even more now. So, yeah, it's just like yeah. I mean, that's why that's why we love. That's one thing I love about Buffalo too. Like, I I have a space here that uh, it's going to be expanding soon, even bigger. I could never do that if I was in California or or even in New York City. So, yeah. right. Yeah, I completely. And now, and now, too, the world is so. Uh, there's this book that I read in college called "The World Is Flat," which has, you know, unfortunately, a different stigma to it now. But what it means is, like, uh, w what they meant by that title is that, like, the um, internet kind of flattened the uh, the world for everyone as far as being able to reach things and make connections. So, and it really has. You know, I can sell puppets from Buffalo all over the world. I don't have to be in New York or L.A. Uh, New York City or LA to be able to sell someone a puppet, but of course there are other advantages uh, to to being in proximity, which is something that we've also talked about recently too. So, yeah. 
I think proximity is interesting, but I think what we have all learned going through stay at home orders and a year of stay at home orders is this, uh, you know, this great, I can take classes in Germany. I can take, I can teach classes in Germany. I can, so that's, that's the main idea of, of being here in Michigan. I, if I need to, I can go to Los Angeles, I can go to New York, but I can also be digitally in your home. So teaching those classes and, and every, it's great. I totally agree with you. Yeah, that's and, great. And it was so, I, I was, Brown Low Pike episode that I was watching, he was like, you know, five years ago, we couldn't have filmed episodes at home, but the iPhone films on 4K. It's like, yeah, five years ago, this would have been so much harder. Right. Uh, because like, everything would have been, just going through uh, stay at home orders would have been so much harder because the technology wasn't there. But now everyone has firsthand knowledge you know, four-year-olds have first-hand knowledge of logging on to Zoom for a class, and that's that's terrific. Everyone just got a crash course in the future. No, it's so a- absolutely great. no, and it it's changed this show. Quality. So, yeah, well, and it's it's been amazing, even um, how much easier it's been explaining to people like logging on to Zoom and stuff for our show. Um, the difference between like. E- e- Two years ago. There was, there was <laughs> more <laughs> hand-holding before. <laughs> yes. Now it's just like, you know, oh, Deb Spinney, do you have Zoom? <laughs> Great. Let's let's do it. <laughs> it was no problem. I yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I love it, too, because it's a master class of, of self-taping at home. Every new mm-hmm. episode in the last year, self-tape audition at home. And, uh, you know, I think there's twofold things of, like, the people who ask for self tapes are now who are now doing it are like, wow, that was pretty challenging and difficult. <laughs> and and then people who are doing it are now able to, I don't know, it, the world opened up and we were able to get so much more in depth content. Right. All the podcasts, the Breda Brothers co- podcast, Under the Frame, all those are great. Totally. Yeah, well, I, I I was just watching some behind the scenes on um, the new Pixar film Luca. And all the voice actors recorded from their home. Like they didn't even go into a recording booth. They were in their like mom's closet. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Couldn't believe the it. Animators were at home. Yeah. Let's, let's hook up these servers. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's terrific. That's, that's amazing. Well, uh, what I, I wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, cause you, uh, you just did something that is, uh, is, a, is a dream for a lot of artists, you know, uh, yeah. getting rid of that full-time job and starting your own business, like that's that's scary a little bit. Was it scary at all for you? Like, what what was that like making that decision and finally finally jumping on it? What did you have to line up a bunch of other things, save a lot of money for a while just in case? Or yeah, what was that like? I think um, yes. Well, thank you uh, for recognizing. But I think there's several things going on. The last ten years were a lot of work of working towards an eventual goal like this. Um, but then also a, a major thing was meeting my now wife, uh, Sophie and partnering, partnering with her, not only, you know, relationship wise, but also business wise. And, and we're running a business together with busy hand studios. Mm-hmm. So it's those, and she had been working also the last 10 years, um, really hard doing independent consulting. So, um, you know, it's, I, and there was a lot of lineup for figuring out what, how to make that jump and how to, how to do it. I, I wouldn't have, you know, a year ago, I wouldn't have known that I would move to Michigan or make this jump that wasn't in the cards, but then, uh, the shutdown happened and, and you have to make, choices very or I, I chose to make drastic choices anyway yeah, yeah. Uh, I, <laughs> I don't know so so the last five years I you know for the actually for the previous six years I was a full-time uh, performing arts uh, on staff teacher at a independent school in Los Angeles as well as doing freelance work um, in the Los Angeles area and because it was a full-time teaching job that um, helped me uh, a lot um, in terms of 
being able to save up and just cover expenses for student loans and other things like that. And then, uh, and then, yeah. Uh, sorry, that was a hard question because it really is the last 10 years of work um, uh, and it's all starting to pay off. And then we're excited to do more uh, personal artwork. No, I love that. And I love so much that you and Sophie like do this together too, because I have also some other friends that are even other types of artists. And and I wonder, I've asked, I'm like, I'm like, how is he able to do this? Like he does his art full time. You find out, oh, his wife's a doctor or something, right? They, they, <laughs> yeah. they get their health insurance and benefits from their, from sometimes from their uh, spouse's job for, for, for anyone, you know? And uh, the fact that you guys are doing this together is, is so awesome and so special too, that um, uh, it's just amazing. It really is just amazing. Thank you. Well, you know, one of the things that we're working on, we're, we're making artist supplies and paint palettes and puppet things. And we are both the same type of uh, worker and creator. And so that we, you know, we sit down, we work, 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 work. But, but the other half of it is we produce a lot quickly because there's two of us. And that's, that's the only reason there's, there's two of us where it, it wouldn't, if it was just me, mm -hmm. I am incredibly slow at crafting. Uh, it's one of the, that's one of the barriers personally, I think that I had working in freelance, um, shop situations, situations, um, in that I'm, I'm slow. I, I, I'm not a fast builder. <laughs> I'm not a fast crafter. You know, we worked on the uh, White Rabbit together. Yes, I was <laughs> going to bring that up that later. That was super fun. Yeah. Super fun. 24-hour <laughs> uh, film festival. Uh, and, uh, you know, Adam, you whipped out uh, those two main <laughs> rabbit puppets. And then you're like, uh, you know what? This character is a puppeteer. We need two more puppets. <laughs> yeah. uh, like, Chase, could you make them? I was like, okay, I'll make them. And then I, like... It's kind of like slow. I made these kind of slightly ugly, like hand puppet things. Yeah, yeah. I was going to bring that up later, saying that it's probably one of the, the most proudest projects you've ever worked on. <laughs> <laughs> the Buffalo 40 an hour film produced uh, with us. Yeah. And, uh, that was, uh, yeah, why don't we jump into that real quick? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because that was so fun. Because uh, we used to do the 48 for a while, and I'm actually doing it again this year uh, for the first time in a while. But um, the 48 was something we always did because it was a fun challenge. And I really encourage anybody to do it now. And, and for the same reasons that you mentioned earlier, I think more people have an aptitude to do it now by themselves that they might not have had before because going through the pandemic, everyone kind of got this crash course in film and, and being even used to being on camera. But uh, it's such a great exercise because you have 48 hours to, to, to write, uh, film, produce, edit, and, and deliver this the short film, which is, I mean, there's no better way to make content. Because anytime we, we try to do our own project, like, oh, we're going to keep this one simple. It just gets dragged off into something that's going to be like three, four months long. But you can't do that with the 48, which is the magic of it. And over those years, we've brought in people. We've brought in Jake Bazell. We brought in uh, you as well to help us with uh, this project. And, yeah, that was, a, that was a special one. That wasn't yeah. our first one, was it? That was the first one that we did ourselves. That's yeah. the first one we did ourselves. Wow. Wow. You rented yeah. a theater. That was awesome. <laughs> Good. Yeah, rented. Audience was coming rented, in to it. see a movie as we were finishing the shots. Yes. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Oh, man. I can't um, remember. It was like Jurassic Park or something like Indiana Jones for something. It was a... <laughs> Something like that. That's yeah. right. Yeah, and if people want to watch it, I'll, I'll link it right here in the in the card there. So and yeah. it'll be in the show notes. Right, for sure. Um, but yeah, can you talk about? So, uh, you know, you I think you came from Michigan, right? Was that? Like, I remember you driving driving to Buffalo. Like what? Um, like what? What made you say yes to come in over? And you know, for no one gets no one's allowed to get paid. Um, and you're just kind of crashing in Adam's, you know, guest room and stuff. Like, uh, what, what made you want to do that with us? Pretty much, pretty much that I, you know, I had been roommates with Adam at, at the O'Neill and I thought, you know, oh, why I pass forgot. up this other yeah. opportunity? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Let's, let's try this. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. It was so I, have, I have a folder. It said your roommate, 
uh, Adam Krittinger on the. Uh, <laughs> oh, you still have it? Oh my, oh my god, <laughs> that's great! Oh my gosh, wow, holy cow! Yeah, that's crazy. Um, well, you know, at the time of what is that? Twenty thirteen? Yeah, I think uh, so. Twenty. Twenty. Either it was. I think twenty fourteen. I think it was twenty fourteen. Twenty fourteen. Okay. So yeah. So at that time, I I was also in Michigan. Um, I'm originally from Chicago. I was born and raised in Chicago, and then I did high school or middle, some of middle school and high school in Michigan. Then I went to CalArts and was there for four years. And then after CalArts, I went back back home to Michigan, um, where I was teaching and, and doing after school classes. And um, and for doing the White Rabbit, let's see, I think. The Geppetto Festival was before White Rabbit. Yes, yes, that was so, 2013 because that was my senior project over at Damon College. So that's terrific. So let's see. So our relationship starts sometime in probably 2011-ish online, um, where a lot of yes. great relationships happen. So I think <laughs> yes. we were online on on Facebook. You know, mm-hmm. I have a whole bunch of friends, uh, puppeteer friends that I have met really only recently that I met on MySpace when I was, uh, <laughs> you know, when I was 12. High school. Uh, yeah. them on, so it's a great place to meet uh, uh, people. So I met Adam in an AIM chat room. <laughs> ah, that's, a, that's <laughs> perfect. It was well, like, you got right mail. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> it is. Uh, so, um, but, yeah, then we met at the O'Neill in 2012. In, in person. Oh, yeah. That's so funny. Okay, yeah. so we met at the O'Neill, and then we did the Geppetto Festival. Uh, it was your senior project. I was showcasing my senior project uh, from, from CalArts, and, and, then, and then you asked a year later, would you be part of this White Rabbit and, uh, or the 48-hour film festival? I was like, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Uh, I was very excited to jump from Michigan because you can drive through. It was very, it's a very quick drive. It's like four hours, go through Canada, uh, go to Niagara Falls. I hadn't been there. That's right. Yeah, no, it's like this great little secret passage. <laughs> yeah. It was, yeah. And, Say hi to uh, Ronnie Burke. You're kind of a really quick project. I, I, yeah. here's, I think one of the things that I, it's every opportunity is – exciting and and try to be a part of any opportunity you can and especially when you're collaborating with friends who is i watching i was watching somebody else uh on your podcast that was like anytime that you can work with your friends this is a friend's industry and um entertainment anyway filmmaking television and anytime you can work with your friends that's like a great paid play date i mean 48 hours wasn't paid but Still, a great play date. We got to play yeah. for like three days. It was yeah. amazing. Yo, oh, yeah. yeah. Again, I love that pressure of it having to be done too, because then like you can't, you know, you just can't dilly daddle. You just get straight into the work. Everyone just focusing on finishing. And yeah, you, you when you go through something like that, again, almost it's like a, it's almost like a mini O'Neill in a way, right? Doing a participant piece, but all in like two days. And then like again, that having that kind of pressure just kind of makes you, yeah, makes you guys bond even even more. It's just great. I just I'm excited for it this year uh, too. So yeah, it's yeah. the gauntlet of of like just everyone's awake. And you're going through that genius hour of everyone still up at 4 a.m. Yeah. And you're making the most creative choices together. It's that mind meld. Right? A little too creative sometimes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know if any of our 48s are necessarily things we're going to hang on the fridge. But, no. uh, yeah. but White I, Rabbit's I, probably I, my proudest yeah, one. Yeah, it actually probably <laughs> is probably one, of the, probably one of the better ones, the, the first one. But uh, but again, we, it's, it's even if... You do end up with that content, which is great at the end. But again, it's just you learn so much. It's a crash course. You learn so much in just doing something and producing something that fast. It's just it's the way you learn anything is by repetition, getting that muscle memory. And it's the perfect tool for learning those types of skills quickly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's what I love about the O'Neill. It's like it's dedicated time and you're repeating over and over. Theater also, you know, when I started teaching, I didn't realize how much, you know, it was, I was learning, I didn't go to school for teaching. 
but I um, started teaching uh, in after school classes and then it kind of became. But I realized uh, realize how much teaching is repetition and it's kind of like being a stand-up comedian where you do the same, you do one bit and then for the next class you do the same bit again and you're like, ah, that didn't play in the middle still. Like there's a lag to my <laughs> rhythm and then you like do it a third time and it's way better. Like yeah. usually when I had a subject to teach and I was teaching it to, you know, three or four different classes, the third and fourth class got the better lecture. Yeah. Or, you <laughs> yeah know, the better examples. <laughs> that's exactly right. Wow. No, that's, that's so true. And especially, I don't know if you've had this experience. I worked for a, a as a, a substitute teacher for about a year and a half. And so learning how to play the different grades too. Like I, I was really great with fourth graders because they just like got my 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 brand of of delivery You're on and the same mental and stuff. level. Oh, exactly, yeah. that's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but like seventh graders, I was still scared of seventh graders from you know when I was a, a seventh grader myself. So it was like a different level level of intimidating and yeah. <laughs> that's so funny. I love I love that age group. I love I love kindergarten. Mm -hmm. And then I love third and fourth grade. Um, and, and then for me, uh, I, I did a couple of classes at, at the college level and doing college, it's going to sound terrible, but it, it felt like the same wavelength as kindergarten mm -hmm. where all my jokes played. I just did my kindergarten jokes. They played <laughs> college, loved it. And, um, it was that was so much fun. No, that's exactly what I always say too. Kindergarten and third grade are like my favorite grades, without a doubt, to teach. Yeah, that's and I think thing. because kindergarten is sophisticated and they're like so loose, and by college you're also sophisticated. It's not that college is at a lower level; it's that kindergarten's at a higher level, right? And yeah, uh, and it's just like the greatest people to work with. And, and also, what I like about it too is that they have just like less self-awareness like they're not critical on themselves generally as much they're just free they'll just try anything and after third grade is when that starts to go away that's why yeah, like middle schools like can be rough especially yeah. in the art because there's so much uh they're self so critical self so much self-doubt and social aspects too like even if you're a good artist you don't want your friend next to you to feel bad so you're not going to try as hard i mean there's just so many dynamics that they can be there sometimes but yeah you just it just there's nothing in the way. Oh, yeah, and then they start getting relationships and getting moody about things. It's like, oh, I just want to make art. Come on, kids. <laughs> That's great. But, uh, but yeah, let's, uh, let's get, I want to go more into the, the origin of uh, Chase Wooler. Yeah, some of the definitely. stuff that I know, but I want to explore some, some new things as well. Um, yeah, so when, uh, when did you find puppetry? When did it, or when did puppetry find you? So I... My origin story is, is very similar to a lot of other puppeteers where it really starts around five, six, seven, eight. And I, I think this is the same, that age group of, of exploration and, and in you're finding that you can entertain others outside of yourselves. So there's a couple of things that went on with me. I, I grew up in downtown Chicago, uh, right downtown off Michigan Avenue. So it's kind of like you know, around the holidays, it's like Home Alone 2 or, you know, just like holiday decorations everywhere and store displays in Marshall Fields or Montgomery Ward or all the department stores. And because of those store displays, I would see those all the time and, and they were year round at that time. So uh, that was a huge inspiration, seeing these vignettes of, of performances over and over again, just staring and watching, uh, you know. Early 90s, lots of quality content on PBS with not just Henson work, but it opened up, you know, late 80s to early 90s, the Henson workshop really opened up and created, you know, everyone, everyone went different ways and they created a lot of different shows. Uh, Puzzle yeah, Place get, was a huge inspiration. Right. Canada, you Canada, Canada window was and stuff. Eureka's, all, like all those Nick shows too. Exactly. Uh, Whimsy's Playhouse, uh, all all of those, um, Dudley the Dragon, Whimsy's Playhouse, Puzzle Place, um, and the Muppet Show. Great. The Muppet, like they were still rerunning Muppet stuff on on Nickelodeon too. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Amazing. I I got Nickelodeon later, 
uh, because we only had the three basic channels. Oh, okay. Uh, was, isn't this crazy? Like, this is like, <laughs> like our, our, our generation, like we're really adept at computer and like, but, but we still had to like turn the ch TV on. Yes. <laughs> Why, Push channel like three to make a VCR go. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. playing with yeah. the bunny ears and stuff. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, so I only had like PBS and, and, and until, uh, uh, at seven or so. And then I got Nickelodeon and got those. But, uh, so I, I saw the Muppet show and Fraggle Rock on VHS, uh, and, and blockbuster video or uh hollywood video or you know a bunch of regional rental yeah and then so so there's those those coming in content of experience of window displays and children's television this one time on pbs they ran uh how it's made of puzzle place and so i saw uh the puppeteers of puzzle place uh working from down below and that was like whoa amazing these people there's people doing my favorite show there's they're they're doing this so that opened me up and then when i was five uh my brothers were born and they're twins and so it's instant audience of <laughs> so i have two people to perform for and uh and and <laughs> and that that's what i was like going after when did they, they ever do puppetry too Sorry. Did they ever do puppetry as well? They later, on, yeah. They later on they uh, helped me. They're my uh, stage assists, or they would be my right hands. That's great. Uh, they're toy designers. Oh uh, really? Oh great. Yeah. So they're so they are Both still in the creative field. Both of them. Well, here's the <laughs> twins. Uh, yeah. Right. You know, one one does uh, plastics and the to toy design, and then the other does the graphics, and so you know, toy and then box. Right. It's oh, great. So that's amazing. It's that great. Wow. Yeah. So, so they, they helped me a lot. And, uh, but that was my inspiration of like nap time. This is the perfect time to put on a show. <laughs> I mean, nobody wants that. Like they're going down for that, but they're laughing. And you know, it's that thing of toddler laughter where it's just like, uh, I don't know. It just makes you feel it's, so good. So I got those dopamines from nice. performing. Yeah. And then I took my show from doing it for my brothers to my first grade classroom. And I would travel around with my uh, uh, cl um, closet wire, stick <laughs> it on the door, and then perform lip sync or other shows to my classrooms in first grade and second and third grade. Oh my gosh, that's so crazy. That's and yeah. then, so Chicago's a huge puppet town. It, it has always been, it's the home of Kukla, Fran, and Ali, um, and other, and I, I really like the old ideas of this regional local television. So for me, it was WTTW and, and you know, New York has this other uh, market and Boston had a, a market. But uh, at the time, Kukla, Fran, and Ali just opened up this huge uh, exhibit at the Chicago Historical Society where they're still on, on view. But they had this exhibit where you could be a puppeteer and work on monitor. And they had uh, the puppets there and you could see Bert Tilstrom working. And so that was super inspiring. Like, oh, great. This is what I'm doing. They did this. Puzzle Place did this. I'm doing this. This is kind of what I'm doing in my classroom puppet shows. And, and, and then there's also the Chicago theater world where, uh, you know, there's Red Moon Puppet Theater at the time. And my mom found classes for me because uh, I wasn't really into the athletic classes. You know, there's early 90s. Everyone was into soccer. I hated soccer. I would pick off mud from my shoes and make little sculptures um, <laughs> during the game. And everyone would be like, go! But no, no I mean, lie. I used to, so I I played on a soccer team a, a lot through grade school, and I would sit in the grass and just pick the grass because I didn't want to, like, play in the game. That was that I've was my contribution to the team. <laughs> no, never. Yeah, I've, I've never made a goal 
I've we're on the same wavelength. So yeah. <laughs> I I took classes and uh, Blair Thomas had a class for children uh, at the Red Moon Puppet Theater and. Uh, that's where I learned about crankies, about uh, found object puppetry. And, you know, I'm, I'm five and learning about this. And then after the class, you get donuts. And so it's like, that's the best part. So I did that. And then also circus school instead of, so- or in addition to, unfortunately, in addition to soccer. But <laughs> Wow. But that's such a great, like, I I really wish that I had had an earlier exposure to other kinds of puppetry. Um, like, I think the most I got was, you, you know, kind of being immersed in learning about the, the Lion King musical when that was coming out. But otherwise, like, I really didn't experience certainly object puppetry and crankies until probably until, like, college. Um, so it's, it's, it's awesome that you were getting that um, education so so early on i it's when i look back at it it's very exciting there was also a chicago puppet theater uh and uh or chicago puppet theater fest um and took over the whole city there was heather henson would do a show and other it was basically what puppet slams are now and so i went as a seven-year-old and uh what puppet slams are now is kind of what they were uh, then, but it was just like all this adult content that I was consuming and probably shouldn't have, but I watched these <laughs> great, you know, um, gosh, uh, I saw these, I can't remember her name right now, but I'll, I'll, it'll come back to me, but these matchbox shows performances on little matchbox puppet shows. Oh, were, were kind of like crankies. I, um, and, and then she taught at Cal arts later on. And I told her, I saw your show when I was seven. It was great. That was the first time like, oh, it's not just television puppets. It's also, there's these other forms of theater, matchboxes, giant pig puppets. And they were telling these stories. So that's what I love about theater, where you have that, that slight feeling of fear of uh, the liveness of something coming towards you or happening in front of you. Yeah. So that, that excitement and Primal fear was very exciting to me. One thing that I did know, I didn't know about all that. I, I, I had no idea how young you really got into puppetry. The only thing that I really remembered uh, you talking about before um, was that you started like a puppetry club in high school, which I thought was really fascinating because, um, uh, you know, I would encourage anyone else listening if you're younger to do that as well, because I imagine part of the reason to do that is um, – uh, you know, as you're saying, maybe your brothers got older and didn't want to be your stagehands anymore. What are you going to do? Let's try to get other friends into puppetry. Like, if there's no other puppet friends around, you got to make them, right? <laughs> That's exactly it. You know, my brothers were their own best friends because there's two of them. And oh, so there's yeah. still this one who wants attention. And when they don't want to be performed to, others do. Or that's what I had to learn and find out. So, yeah, I from all those classes, I... I also joined the San Francisco Bay Area Puppet Guild um, because at the time my parents are graphic designers and in Chicago and, and at the time they were going back and forth between Chicago and San Francisco because the digital pipeline was just starting. Right. And, and Adobe was just starting and so they were looking so we they were going there a lot and they were I was coming along and 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 so I was around all these adults all the time making work uh and performing for each other and and being involved in the conversations so i had a lot of uh uh face-to-face time with adults and not so much face-to-face time with other students except when i was performing with them and so by the time i got to high school uh i was looking around like what am i doing probably like most high schoolers most high schoolers are in the hallways like what am i doing (laughs) And my high school had 6,000 students, wow. and which is huge for a high school. And there were 6,000 students, you know, four buildings, uh, like something like eight football fields. Something incredible. Anyway, it's huge. I thought, you know what? They have two theaters and they're competing theaters. There's a, a little theater and uh, I can't remember. what I wasn't part of that art theater group. So... Um, park players and uh 
you know, there, so there were part, there were these two theater groups and I thought, I really want to do puppetry. I want to bring my knowledge and I want to share and I need other puppeteers. I need other hands. It can't just be me. So I started a puppetry club because there were robotics clubs and I thought, ah, this will be a great collaboration. Robotics clubs, puppet club, there's this television news club. So I, let's, let's take advantage of all this plus theater. So I started um, my freshman year, a puppet club or a puppetry club. And that was at the time of, at the very beginning of MySpace and uh, Muppet Central uh, forums. And so there was a lot of other shareable content like, okay, this, this is my lesson plan. Cause I didn't have, I didn't have, um, I guess access to copiers, but I had access to the internet. This is my lesson plan and get self promotion out, uh, get members and then send them that the Muppet central stuff or any, or at the time puppet vision with Andrew, uh, that yes. was pretty great. Yeah. So using that in high school, um, and we had, you know, every week we'd meet every Tuesday and every week we'd have 20 other high schoolers showing up. And then, so that was like my freshman year. And so it eventually grew to 40 or so. And I was teaching this class every Tuesday, a puppetry class. And we were doing shows, um, in the community and a annual, like big annual review of what we learned. Um, and then it continued for two years after I left, which was, I felt, a pretty good legacy for a high school club. That made me think then, too, like, so when, uh, you know, I imagine at least through the San Francisco Guild, you were meeting some pretty prominent puppeteers. Um, when, when did you start making contact with, because I know you've worked a lot very closely with, with Marty Robinson. You actually helped him... Um, teach a course at, at the O'Neill. Um, when, when did those sorts of connections really start to kind of bubble up? So uh, the San Francisco Bay Area Puppet Guild is really fascinating because it started by, uh, by Frank Oz's parents. Uh, right. And that's pretty fascinating. And because of the Bay Area connection, they would have... Uh, master classes with Dave Goals. Um, at, oh, well, this is, this is where it's like a big puppet universe, like Marvel universe where everyone's interacting. <laughs> but so at the time when I was there, the Swazzle brothers were the presidents, the Patrick and Sean Johnson. Yeah. They were the president of the guild. They even uh, Mike, share Mike the presidency Grant, too. <laughs> Pardon me? They share the presidency too. Is that normally a split position? Um, they work with you know, one brain. They, so I was going to say, yeah, they are. No, I'm just trying to, yeah, that, that, that's awesome. Yeah. That's, uh, and they're inspiring the too. Yeah. So they were, they were the, um, leaders there and they were bringing in a lot. Of, they were bringing in Dave goals for a master class. They brought in Mike Quinn and Karen Prell for a master class. And, and they brought, uh, the fireys and the worm from the labyrinth and the hands from the labyrinth. They brought with them all these great creatures, and that was amazing. Oh and uh, and then then they had a uh, a gala, or somebody hosted a gala for um, maybe it was Adobe. It was a lifetime achievement award for Carol Spinney, and uh, I knew I had to be there for that one. And I worked it. That's where I got to meet Carol Spinney and. It was cool because he, he like mentioned my name in his speech, his acceptance speech, and that was pretty cool. Wow! Uh, uh, because he was like, "Yeah, I, I thank you for this award, something, something." And uh, I, I have people are coming from all over. There's a young man from Chicago that came to visit for this. Who knew? Something like that. <laughs> yeah. um, be on cloud nine. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I'm in the back. I'm in the back, like. <laughs> <laughs> at a table by yourself like oh my gosh <laughs> oh in, my in the God. doorway washing dishes <laughs> yeah well one thing um one thing that i always thought was interesting about you is uh i mean you've you're you're very humble about a lot of the work 
that you've done, a lot of the professional work that you've you've um, been a part of. And I remember asking you that years ago. I think maybe even while we're working on White Rabbit, that keeps coming up. Um, that uh, like I, because I again, I know you had worked with the Muppets and and and, and tons of projects and even TV spots uh, like uh, right handing and things like that. And you'd never know that if someone followed you really on Instagram or yeah. on Facebook or, or anywhere. And I remember asking you about that and your answer was, uh, was really awesome. And I was, I was wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit about that too. Uh, thank you. Um, I, well, I wish I remember the, it's, you know, <laughs> Do you want the cliff notes? <laughs> any sort of awesome response that sounds great. Uh, um, for uh, well, for me, when I do the jobs, I'm I'm doing my own like I'm doing my I'm achieving my own dream, and when I achieve, you know, achieving dreams is somewhat personal, and and I I don't want to either bore people with, with like, Hey, I just, I just, you know, uh, I, I just worked with people who they may not know where, you know, like Mike Quinn, <laughs> all of Mike Quinn, Mike Quinn. And like, it's, a, it's an amazing, uh, opportunity to like work with, I just worked with Dave Barclay and I'm like, this is amazing. I don't get starstruck. Um, for big time celebrities, I get starstruck for these puppeteers that I've been watching and, and really learning from my whole life. Um, and, uh, you know, there's still some people that I'd like to meet, but I, you know, I, I really want, um, on social media, I, I don't take pictures on set, so I don't have good content to share. Uh, I don't, I, that's. Part of the thing on, on Muppet set where there's two things going on. One, I really want to work. Two, I'm really nervous. And so uh, I I don't... You don't want to give I, them a reason to not call you back, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I don't know about you, but I, one of those things of like when I stand in the room, I'm like, okay, well, this is already a reason for them not to call me back. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm very... Uh, I'm always, I'm ready to perform and work, but I'm also very nervous that it looks too eager. Yeah, um, yeah that's I, kind of what you were talking I'm about too, to just being, uh, you know, making sure that you are seen as professional on, on set and stuff. And also you kind of mentioned that like, it's not your project to share really, right? You're just a player in this bigger thing and it's uh, a, an amazing opportunity. You get to work with people that you've idolized your whole life. And, and when you post stuff, well, you're going to post about your work rather than projects of other people's that, that you've worked on, even though you are so grateful to be a part of it. Exactly. I'm, I'm very grateful to, uh, you know, right hand for Kermit on the tonight show but that doesn't like that's not that's not the thing. Uh, it should be, Kermit is Kermit, and no nobody's performing his right hand. <laughs> yes, yes. Like, like that's that's the. It's really. I I don't need to take credit. I I just want to be there. Yeah. No, and that and that's, that's a great like, mentality. I just took credit for that, but I don't mean to. <laughs> well you gotta tell the story right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. no but yeah. and and that's so true to um just like i think a puppeteer's mentality of like there yeah of there 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 are no right handers like there there are no like no one cares about the the performer to a certain degree i was i was having a conversation uh with our friend bob the other day about how like you know after you know, Jim Henson and Frank stopped, you know, doing appearances on The Tonight Show. It was no longer, it was just Kermit on The Tonight Show. Um, you know, it was just, you know, Gonzo sitting on the couch with Dave Gold's, you know, sewn in down there. Um, because it, it, it was that focus towards the, just the characters. Um, so. I've been watching a lot of your recent stuff. Uh, and I like Adam's idea of, for recent social media things, focus on the character and then people will get excited about whatever content you're making, whether it's a show or whatever, 
focus on that character. And I was thinking about it the other day of there aren't very many puppet characters that have their own initiative right now for either social media or producing content where like in the past there used to be with like Topo Shijo. Right now, I think there's only Warwick Ronlow Pike who's doing his, and, and Phil Fletcher, doing puppet content that has characters that create their own accord where as I'm not sure that Muppets have, they don't have that. It doesn't feel like they have that freedom yeah. right now where like they're characters that live outside themselves. Mm -hmm. Like, and then you have Madam in the past where like that is a character that lives outside herself. Uh, Senor yeah. Wences is who I was thinking of. Mm -hmm. Senor Wences would go on all the time and, and like they would have characters that could kind of create on their own accord. Yeah. yeah. Land well, chopped even a in a way, way, Jim Henson kind of kind of did that, right? And the way he built these characters and did a lot of TV spots and commercials, then it turned into a show. So many people try to reverse engineer that. They build the characters, they want to build their show, and they don't have that build up enough and uh, a build up to that, a demand for. There was in a way there was a demand for Jim to create a show because people loved his commercials and his spots so much. And people forget about that. And I, I did yeah. for a while, too. I was, I was trying to make a puppet. I have a new project that I'm working on called Hubble. And I'm going to kind of do it in reverse. Rather than try to produce this, you know, an entire episode and show, like, no, it's, I'm going to do some social media stuff. Like, if it kind of let the character grow naturally, you know, and let people want there to be an episode. They might say, if I start yeah. getting a bunch of comments, oh, I'd love to see a full episode of this. Like, oh, okay, maybe maybe now is the time. But uh, otherwise, people spend years creating and building something that no one's going to watch because no one's built a relationship with it yet. Exactly. Yeah, I'm, I've, <laughs> I've been working for maybe 12 years on a, on a TV show pitch idea um and i love the characters but i just have the characters on my board they don't exist in physical reality yet they're all in writing but it's that trying to get that flow going of like what why am i being so precious with this and why is it so why am i focused on the show why aren't i focused on the characters that's who people mm -hmm. like it's yes. like that idea that pixar idea Focus on the story. What is your story? Then people will care and they'll love it. And then, so it's, uh, it is challenging. It is challenging because you see, I mean, there's other terrific, this year there's so many terrific shows with puppets on them, but, but then you think about other, what you kind of want to emulate. Like my dream is to create and work on or even work on work on a show like, you know, Bear in the Big Blue House or uh, It's a Big, Big World or Big and Small, like those kinds of children's shows, Tots TV. Oh, that was on in the 90s. Something, work on a show and, uh, and, and as a complete thing. That's a dream. And now I have to reverse engineer it. Like, how do I get to there? Down, yeah. down. How well, actually, what uh, what kind of was your uh, break into working on some of these pro uh, professional puppetry productions? High school, this really interesting thing. There's Puppet Rampage, Puppeteers of America Festival. That's my that's my big break, personally, because I meet Marty Robinson at the Puppet Rampage at Puppeteers of America, Ronnie Burkett, Philip Huber, uh, the Silson Brothers uh at disney um and uh, jim rose i took a class uh so many other professionals and i i meet it, my world gets bigger and they're also doing a college uh thing where yukon is representing there but so is cal arts and at the time cal arts only had an mfa program in puppetry and they we were talking and we eventually it got to the point where uh, Marcian Del Delis, um was talking to me and was like, we have to have you at CalArts. Let's start a BFA program. I'm, I have a year until I graduate high school. And I'm like, this is great. I'll go to CalArts. I'll 
take master level classes, but I had a BFA, I'll be a BFA, but take master level classes. Terrific. Um, and then at the same time, you know, the Silson brothers in 2017 are like, oh, why don't you come to Disney World and audition? And uh, I did that. Uh, that wasn't, uh, I thought it was going to be a really cool path because I, I really just wanted to work at the time. And at the time on MySpace, I'm friends with all the Walt Disney World puppeteers and, and builders doing Playhouse Disney, uh, Ian Sweetman. Uh, he's sending me all the like behind the scenes footage of Bear in the Big Blue House and really cool stuff. So like that's all part of it. And uh, uh, and then I go to CalArts, starting a BFA puppetry program. I kind of learned to make it what um, I need it to be, uh, which is kind of like a CalArts vibe of like, uh, you go in and you make it high. The teacher tells you, this is what I'd like you to do. The student then goes, well, this is what I, how I would like you to get better <laughs> in, in, <laughs> over the course of the semester. So let's work on this together. It's like a collaboration. Um, and you know, I've, so Marty Robinson, O'Neill, 2008 work, work, uh, and then, uh, 2009, I do the O'Neill a second time and I'm working on my own, you know, CalArts projects and doing theater all the time. And then in 2010, Steve Whitmire has a class at the Center for Puppetry Arts, uh, a workshop. And as soon as it was posted on Puppet Vision, I was like, oh, signing up <laughs> and uh, signing up. He never does this. This will be great. Uh, and signed up. Uh, flew to Atlanta. It was my first time in Atlanta. Uh, flew from California. Didn't really have a coat. It's winter. Um, and it snowed in Atlanta. Where, like, who knew? And so Center for Puppetry Arts did the class with Steve, uh, which was the traditional, you know, ping pong balls uh, and um, puppets. There's a great, somebody wrote a really good blog post of what exactly it was. And, um, afterwards he pulled me at Steve Whitmire pulled me aside and said, Hey, you were really good in there. Uh, do you want to do this again? Cause he was doing two workshops in the day and I was part of the first one. I said, yes, yes. <laughs> what are you going to yes. say? No. <laughs> oh my gosh. And I'm not, I'm obnoxious. So I said, yes do you want to see my puppets in this break? And like, and, and, and I pulled out all, you know, and from then he was like, Oh, and we did it a second time. I got it. I met his wife, Melissa and, um, and which very nice. And, we, and, and then I flew off, uh, back to CalArts for like a winter break or something. And then, uh, I guess this is 2000, yeah, two, beginning of 2010. And later, um, I get an email uh, asking, hey, do you want to work? Um, we, we have this movie coming up. Do you want to work on it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> and do you want to see my puppets? I actually, so, <laughs> are, are Should I bring more of my puppets? <laughs> <laughs> do you want me to supply my own? I can supply my own. I'll build Walter. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we, it was, that was so, uh, exciting. So what, uh, I, what was the 2011 Muppet movie, your first, uh, professional experience then? Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. I, I showed up on day one. I didn't even know I was getting paid. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know it was a paid project. <laughs> How stupid, like, isn't, I mean, I didn't even think about that. Like I, I, uh, they called me and I was like, yeah, I'll be there. Yeah. What day? Fantastic. I'll show up. And then they, uh, like, here's the contract. Oh, okay. NDA. Cause I, we did that at CalArts all the time. I didn't know that it was a paid job at all. Like crazy. <laughs> wow. But that's how obnoxious, like it, that's, it's like, yeah, I had, I had no idea. That's, that's just so but, funny. You know, <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, was also working, but so 2010, November, they were filming, I filmed October, November, December. <laughs> uh, 
But in June, July, August, I worked at Puppet Heap building the Muppets uh, for the Muppet movie, 2011 film. Um, that was uh, eye-opening. That was my first shop experience. I had toured shops before, like Animax in Nashville. When I auditioned for Disney World, I toured Animax on my way home. That was amazing. Saw how the puppets were built. And I toured other, you know, Bay Area shops and, and stuff. But then I worked at Puppet Heap for the movie, and that was a master class. I have this, this is my book of notes that I took uh, at Puppet Heap. And it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like laying things out and making etchings, but that's how I treat this book of, like it has really great, I had no idea this is how it was built, content. I think uh, I remember talking writing. to you and I think Christine Dempsey, who was there maybe a similar time. At the same and, time. It was the same time. Okay. And I remember, I think the three of us maybe were talking at an O'Neill about just how like sort of stupid, simple some of the techniques were. And like, you guys were just like, all you need to do is like, see how they do it. And it'll like kind of blow your mind about how accessible some of those things are and how like, Oh, it's, it's as easy as that. And um, that, that just had to be such a, an incredible learning experience I, I can't imagine i think one of those things is like flocking flocking uh is seem when when you pitch the idea and you're like you need the special machinery the special tool like okay it's a little out of can't do that at home uh but then i watched it happen and like oh wow this is totally accessible um let me teach my fourth graders how to do this for like their model kits Wow. Uh, one of the things I think I learned is, or that I was frustrated by, I don't know if you are by as builders and performers, but one of the things is like, it's hard to get the information where it felt hard at the time to get the information and uh, like removable arm rods. Right now, there's a lot of information about removable arm rods. At the time, there wasn't. And, uh, and... <laughs> And so, like, people are doing the thing where, you know, that's, that's like brass stock or clip-ons or doll joints. And, and it's like, when you go there and it's like, oh, yeah, it's a sleeve that you pin. And it's like, oh, you don't have to, like, build this? You, you know, like, everything else felt like building. Okay, you take two-part epoxy, your brass stock, you saw the brass stock. And, and... Um, and it's just pins. Everything's just pins. Yeah. Or tape. What I, I, I get made fun of all the time of, of like most of my set pieces or other things are all gaff tape because I love I, that material is so accessible. You just tear it off. And, you know, this, this is actually what, this is my first puppet ever uh, from when I was four. And it's all tape because I took a class in making tape sculptures. Crazy, but it's amazing. Um, you still have that. Thank you. It's I'm. It's lucky that my parents save everything uh, from childhood. And when you know the show that I'm working on is an idea from first grade. Uh, so it's like you know all the best ideas happen six and below. No, I love I that. And it sounds I like you're still still saving everything if you've got a, a folder with this guy's name in it. <laughs> for being yeah, roommates. I know. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard trait that Sophie is actually helping me, uh, you know, wean off of. Yeah. Like, I, I think we found the real like, reason why they moved <laughs> yeah. to a big and bought a big house. <laughs> so they could fill it with their, his tape sculptures yeah. from when he was five. Yeah. Yeah. Well, some, yeah. yeah, in in the effort of like to be good to your biographer, you also end up being bad to your present self. <laughs> so, yeah, I just, like, actually so much think, shit how, around. How, how are you, do you think that way too? Because I, I think because of um, DVD behind the scenes extras yes. and all the art books. Yes. So this is, I would watch this all the time and think, you know what? I'm going to need this for my museum. And, <laughs> I, swear, uh, Chase, I, I swear to God. I still had like I, I mean I, I, some of the stuff you still still do keep, but like I had napkins like 
not even napkin sketches, but like conversations that I had with college advisors that I would just like keep the napkin on that we had this idea for a thing that like didn't even happen. But it was just like, that's, I got to keep that. I got to, when they make the coffee table book, that's got to be a part of it. (laughs) When you look at like that, it's a sickness. (laughs) yeah, it's hard. I have this coffee, uh, the coffee table book of small films, which is a terrific book in and of itself. But they have all those like, wow, yeah, I should have saved. It's hard. Uh, yeah, because in, in high school, I would make, we were making the shows, but I would also make a behind the scenes documentary. Mm-hmm. And, and, and every show, every year, our annual show would come out. I would make a DVD. I'd make the DVD cover and I'd make special features. Because at the time, do you remember iMovie had yeah. that uh, uh, ability to make DVD extras, like subtitles and all that. Oh, yeah. I, my and sister and I. I did yes. commentary for yes. our show. <laughs> I, re- I have an email. I was looking back at my emails to uh, Chuck Fawcett, head of Animax. Big theme park to- company right now. But at the time, I wrote to him, yeah, here's our show. The first 15 minutes are really good. But definitely stay around for the next 56. Like, like, why would anyone spend that amount of time? And, you know, what you learn at the O'Neill is uh, make it too short to suck. And uh, that's what I like about the 40-hour film festivals and, and, like, just get it out. It's, it's the idea of don't be precious. Whereas, like, this whole other part of my thought process is being precious <laughs> with, with the stuff. Right. No, that's um, yeah. We're this we're we're the same kind of. Tom Little made fun of me, so we were making uh, <laughs> we were making uh, mechanisms at the O'Neill, and Jim Krupa, which your that interview that you did with him, the all of them are great, but the recent one is fantastic. What I like about his thought process is he's always moving forward and presenting what he's working on right now instead of looking past, which uh, unfortunately I'm looking past. But yeah. his I I love that interview, but so. Jim Krupa brings in old Muppet fleets, really good stuff, the thick stuff. Oh, yeah, Adam, you're in that class. Oh, yeah. And we're cutting it, and everyone's like, okay, all the scraps, trash. And uh, I'm picking through the big pieces, like pieces that are like this big, like maybe this big, picking through out of the garbage all the old Antron so I can save it and put it in. Cause it's good. It's like, yeah, this is, this is what that's enough is, for an Island I was gonna say. Wacky sacks in the museum. They obviously threw wacky sacks away. Like, um, this can't happen. Uh, so John, I didn't say any of that. I'm just quietly take picking out of the garbage and John Little's like, look at him. He's picking stuff up, He's picking <laughs> old Antron out of the garbage. I took some too. Yeah. <laughs> I did. I still have a little bit of it. It's but but when you look at it, it's, it's gorgeous. so it's so good. There's nothing like it. And I it have sparkles. I have a little scrap of it that I'm gonna be. I'm making a, a Professor Snape puppet for a, a slam piece, and I've got a little bit of orange that's gonna be perfect just for a nose. Like yeah. So it'll be on it'll be on a Nyla fleece. Like the 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 body of it is fine, but like he's gonna have this precious nose uh, of the old stuff. Yeah, all uh, these spots are old. This hair is flocati. Yeah, and like <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it's hard. It is. I have a whole like yeah, it doesn't matter. I I, I want to talk to you, uh, two two things that have always intrigued me about um about you and your work process and your appreciation for uh for different crafts. But um, can you talk a little bit about your your love for animation and how that's kind of played into your creativity in your work. Cause you have a, a really tremendous artifact that I'm like so <laughs> jealous of. I, you, we've, we've done Skype calls and stuff where you've shown me and I'm like, Oh man, I gotta, I gotta get to wherever Chase is to, to see that in person. But um, yeah. Talk well, I a little think bit the artifact that. is the same thing. You know, everyone in the animation industry is kind of like, why do you want that? That's old. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, and I love, okay. So um, animation Puppetry, you know, we're at in the early 2000s and everything is CG and uh, there's not a lot of industry happening. And I, as I 
as a 12 year old, I see this <laughs> and I'm seeing it on the behind the scenes, but I also see that, oh, well, you know, people are working in character design and uh, animation. And, and obviously this is where it all starts for all these shows where you're looking through these coffee table books or behind the scenes, it all starts with a sketch. Even Big Bird starts with a sketch. This is a lovely sketch. And I think that Jim Henson Designs book comes out around the same time. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking at that like this is con like I in order for me to make the best tools uh, that I can, um, I need to be able to know foundational skills uh, like drawing and painting. And so I took a class at the Center for Creative Studies in Detroit. And basically, I think my the life message is always take classes, always go out and seek classes and other things. So I so I'm taking this animation class who's taught and it's taught by a DreamWorks animator and um, who just left Detroit or just left Los Angeles. And at in that space they have all these animation desks, old style 2D animation desk, and we're doing the bouncing ball, we're learning foundational shapes, making little short animated films, um, you know, on these big desks, but also these big uh, uh, MacBooks at the, you know, the color MacBooks. And uh, so I was like, okay, this has to be it. Then there, I learn about uh, CalArts in general as a school, like, oh, it's founded by Disney, off the profits of Mary Poppins. I love Mary Poppins. It's one of my favorite, like, Disney films. So, and then it was in high school, that, and I'm drawing all the time. Like, I have my first grade teacher and third grade teacher, fourth grade teachers, they'd be like, you know, these math tests would be great if there weren't so many drawings on it. Because um, I, I would draw on this, I would do the math test and draw on the side, draw on this side, and then flip it over, draw on the back. Like there's drawings everywhere, and they're all puppet designs. And I, I want, you know, at the time there are all these puppet builders. Terry Angus, where you had a great interview with him. Terry Angus is doing all these, listing all these puppets on eBay, uh, and like, oh, this is attainable. So I collected those puppets. And then I would draw those puppets. Jared Boucher, or I haven't said his name out loud, so I don't mean to mispronounce it if I did, but he also was doing eBay puppets and draw those characters. And Phil Fletcher at that time was draw, doing these really unique, like big nose uh, characters. So I would just draw and collect those puppets. Uh, so I was learning both design of construction when I had the puppets. I have some of them. Right here, if you want to see. And that then, was the uh, other thing I wanted to talk to you is is your collection of of other builders' puppets. So that's that'll be a great thing to move oh, on to. I I would love to talk. I have some examples here. You know, you know, I just moved in, and not everything is up up, but it will soon be. Yeah. Um. So we're learning all these. It's construction design. I'm teaching myself performance, and I'm learning about character design as well and collecting all these character design books and, and taking the animation class. And my parents are graphic designers and so we have paper everywhere. A very artistic family. Um, so we have paper everywhere, markers everywhere. You know, I can cut a straight line with an exacto blade. I could do that because my parents were doing that all the time. They were model makers and stuff. Back before digital, they were model makers. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I loved animation and I learned about CalArts. And when I found out that they had a puppetry program, I was like, this is terrific because I'll take puppetry, which is what I really would like to do, performance, live animation, and I'll take character animation classes for character design and really work on this professional um, uh, production art, learning how to clean up my draftings, uh, because Michael Curry's shop at the time, they had just published all these draftings that they would do for their puppet designs, and they're amazing. So I would bring those into my drafting, my theater drafting class teacher and say, how do I make my draftings look like this? And go to a character animation teacher, like, I need to make my... What I learned later is, like, these are all different departments that are collaborating but 
in my mind, I'm like, I need to do all of this. And so I start, you know, like, like puppets, I start collecting things. So I started collecting these uh, animation paper, which we were drawing on all the time, and which uh, soon, maybe four years ago, they stopped producing traditional animation paper in Hollywood, in Culver City, um, and Cell Vinyl uh, had some of that. And, uh, you know, classic Walt Disney animation de uh, desks, there's a certain design, and it's this mid-century modern aesthetic by Ken Weber, and I was like, this is, this, you need a desk. And all, everyone at CalArts in character animation would get their own cubicle, their own office. They would get their own cubicle, office, and an animation desk. And I was like, this, and, and I was working in theater on a drafting table. And I thought, well, this is the best of both worlds. I need an animation desk so that I can draft puppets. And living in Los Angeles, Every so often, a animation desk will come up for sale, or recently I've seen on the side of the road in the garbage. Oh my and God. there are these huge behemoth desks um, that are very uh, interesting, and they rotate and they spin, and they light up, and they really help you do what they're meant to do, 2D animation. Everything else are pretty impractical, and they take up a lot of space. And uh, and I collected one. One of my friends was leaving DreamWorks, and they had an animation desk from Spirit Stallion of the Cimarron. And I was like, "This, I need this." So I have an animation desk uh, that I love and cherish, and I work at all the time. I do all my puppet designs on them. All my writing, I, I write at the animation desk. It's great. I love it. That is so cool. Yeah. I'd show you, but it looks so messy right now. I can. <laughs> that's okay. We'll put, we put up a picture. Yeah, of it yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, that's so cool. But the puppet collection, too. I I, I, but I think it, I heard about it through Adam. I think he told me, like, yeah, Chase collects all these different uh, the puppet builders things. And that's got to be, I mean, you, you know, sort of famously, your, your exposure to a Terry Angus puppet mm you know, got this whole ball rolling yeah. and to be able to see the different techniques of different builders up close, see how this person does a mouth plate versus this person does an arm rod and all that sort of stuff is just it had to be incredible. So like to have all those things, what, what was sort of your thought process in, in collecting those and being able to learn from them? Well, so my original idea was I would collect them and, and do a TV show with them because they were the first like, you know, like a musician, in order to make really good music, you need a really good instrument. Your skills as a violinist are great, and then they go up a level when you get high-quality violins. Like, uh, the ones you rent are not the same as the one you would buy or the one that you would invest in. So I was investing in these instruments of uh, that are high-quality, and they, fill, they tickled my imagination. You know, they would have... Uh, an auction every month or so between Ter Terry Angus and, and oh, um, uh, the frog you you have, or um, sorry, I forgot his name right now. Sebastian friend, our, that Zach has. Sebastian. Yes. He's, he's a Terry Angus. Mm -hmm. um, so what I learned from, you know, I learned all these mouth plates. I learned exposed foam mouth plate, I carved foam, hard plate and flexible mouth plates like gasket rubber and plastic. So I learned, oh, this is so interesting. I like the exposed foam mouth plate personally as a performer. And then you just learn all these sewing techniques, not even taking apart the puppet, just looking at this, like, how did you make this? How could I make this? Um, and then I want to do and then I started doing commissions at that time, like, and just doing it yourself, you learn so much, uh, like hands. I hate doing hands, but Terry Angus has a lot of really great uh, hands where they're just exposed foam. Like, I would love to carve instead of sew. So, so I, I didn't know. So learning, learning those techniques and like what's acceptable and what shows up on camera and screen um, was, was great. That's so cool. Can we see a couple of them? Yeah. 
Yes, so, okay. And what I'd also like to say, a lot of these puppets now are, uh, you know, they're at least 20 years old. So they're on the verge of toasting. Got it. So, okay, so this is, this is a bunny. I really like this, this, this bunny character that Terry Angus made. Uh, it's like super charming. Uh, and, and the inside of this bunny is all carved. So it's like, that's why it's slightly asymmetrical right mm -hmm. now because it's on the verge of, verge of being toast. But so I learned, I learned a lot from this character. So the arm jointing, um, the, the arms are so they're tapered. And so that's, I took that into consideration. It looks like a, uh, a character designed puppet here. So like this body shape here, there's no, there's no seam that, you know, on this arm, it's taken, it's really nice. But the outside was one thing, but then when you look on the inside, like how, how is this, <laughs> this is a weird shot, but how is this made? <laughs> How is this made and and what what can we do so when you feel it it's not it's a rigid body so right here uh there's there's rigoline but also a metal um uh hoop so there's one here there's one here and there's one at the bottom so and then it's all covered in foam as well so i learned about structure in the puppet body of uh, it doesn't have to just be foam so at the time on Muppet Central, everyone was making these, uh, you know, one one pattern shape, or you know, six six or so shapes of foam, cut it, glue it all together. Well, what you actually need is a structure and a shape. If you can you can make like a two piece pattern, and and then if you structure it with rigoline or other like hoopings, so that it's like a rigid body, it it, it works out just as well. Yeah. Does that help? And yeah, I think no, that's amazing. Like, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. I've, I've never seen that one. No, me neither. This is all painted. This is exposed foam mouth, uh, fun foam uh, tongue. And then I was like, oh, it's fun foam as a tongue. Terrific. I, I'll, I'll do that. So that's pretty great. A lot of these puppets, because I'm also, I never did the, pro I never made my own TV show or made my own projects except from high school. So a lot of these puppets haven't been seen publicly, you know, since, since the eBay auction. Yeah. So, um, it's kind of nice to show these. I don't know if Terry would ever watch this, but we have, these are puppets that really helped me. So this was my first live hand puppet, this wizard character. Uh, and it, it's a hard foam. Um, so it's exposed foam like a anything Muppet, mm -hmm. it's supposed from here, it's supposed from here, but it's a hard plate mouth plate with uh, the mouth plate has jointing in it. So you can make facial expressions like a flexible uh, character. Uh, and then just seeing how he made this costume, you know, as a 13 year old, seeing how he made this costume was amazing. And then, and then learning how to perform it and just adding in subtle character things so that one's really cool too I yeah like yeah I, uh, you know I, and one of the sad things is too i don't really have characters for any of these puppets i just have they just provide immense uh inspiration so even though i've had these characters for a long time i don't have voices for them i don't have names i i some of them i have mannerisms for but I uh <laughs> well, well I imagine you've used some of these for um some of your auditions and stuff. Audition tapes and stuff. Tapes. Yeah. Yeah, all my self tapes I, I use. Uh for me, it yeah, I use these for my self tapes. Uh I set up similar to this where it's just lighting and I watch on the monitor and and I try to do uh interesting content. <laughs> but for me uh, it's that I it's not always, uh, I just try to do character things. I try to show off, um, character, my puppet manipulation, like, look, it, it feels like it has legs. It has eye focus. Um, uh, cause a lot, of, well, yeah. 
So like tap dancing, the fact that I can hide the arm sleeve, really easy. Yeah, and you probably start to learn too how, you know, you, you said, you know, certain characters have specific mannerisms and probably some of that is dictated by the the styling and the the build of the puppet too, uh, which is a learning experience in its in itself. Yeah, Jerry Nelson's great advice of look at the character and if it has a big mouth, maybe you know you can have a loud voice, or it has a very small voice, uh, and it's like it's like looking at the character and coming up with that. Jerry Nelson was like so cool with his characterizations. And... Oh yeah, the man, oh, man yeah, of he... a million Muppets. Yeah, uh, but there, you know, there's one more thing I wanted to talk about too, and I'll have you kind of take the reins from it. Talk, talk to me about Dudley. Dudley is a is a puppeteer story in in and of itself. I think uh, I so uh, Dudley the Dragon, Canadian show. Uh, or show out of Toronto in uh, 94, 95, maybe 95, 96. Um, and at the time, public broadcasting is going, it's, it's I, I think, looking back, it's evolving. So, so Barney comes out, um, and it's a younger uh, audience than Sesame Street, or it's a more focused audience than Sesame Street. They're trying to do the same thing with Dudley the Dragon. It's about this uh, uh, green, goofy dragon who fell asleep, Rip Van Winkle, woke up, and these kids uh, are, I don't know, helping him or doing some adventure, like tr- showing him that all his he slept through all his family being extinct, and now he's the last one or something. Something seemingly dark. I love Dudley the Dragon, and that was my Halloween costume in first in kindergarten. Uh, I, there's probably a picture, and so my grandma helped me make the suit. Uh, we're sewing it together. We're uh, making the cardboard head off of a, a bicycle helmet, and and then we go to uh, Halloween, the Halloween parade at school, and like okay. For my performance, I have to like, keep my uh, right hand pinned to my chest. So the entire time I'm waving and I'm like this, because Dudley in the first season of, of the show, and there were like three, it didn't have big, big bird technology. of uh, and It was just pinned to his chest. And then in the second season, they made a new suit where it has the string. Um, so... I aced it. Everyone was like, oh, it's Dudley, it's Dudley, it's great. Uh, and WTTW at the time also had meet and greets for the stars. So you could meet Miss Frizzle. I think you could meet the Puzzle Place characters. Like it was like, you could meet Sky and Nuzzle, so, so Peter Lintz. Um, and they had other meet and greets. And so they had this Dudley a Dragon meet and greet uh, in Chicago. And unfortunately, I was we were late arriving like an hour late arriving and he was no longer there. And, but I got his, his glossy card that was signed. And I was like, ah, it was great. Fast forward to 2012 or no, 2013, I guess. 2013 scrolling through YouTube, searching Dudley, a dragon content. Cause I had collected the plush on, on uh, eBay, and and at the time, Dudley the Dragon was supposed to be huge. He had entire rows of FAO Schwartz uh, in downtown Chicago. The entire row, I remember seeing all the plushes and different content and books. And he had a Macy's Day Parade balloon. Uh, and it's one of the few Macy balloons to pop. <laughs> oh. he, and, and that's why he's never, so so they were spending so much money his balloon popped and like three months later, the company was bankrupt. Um, not, not because of the balloon, but it's like an interesting allegory. Symbolism, yeah. <laughs> for, for this, you know, yeah. this, this uh, rise of what was supposed to be like Barney. Mm-hmm. Um, and even Carol Spinney thought it, Dudley the Dragon was a competitor. In his book, uh, 
he's, he writes that it, like it was a major competition at the time. They had to change the format of the show in order to match the Dudley audience. Um, so fast forward to 2013 and I'm scrolling through YouTube and somebody has a, not a Dudley costume, like, like a bad ripoff, but the Dudley costume and is going through bowling, uh, bowling birthday parties. Uh, so like, uh, or, or even doing birthday parties for adults in a bar. And so like they're doing, uh, somebody had the Dudley costume. So, uh, I had to get in contact with them. They're in Canada in Mississauga. And, uh, we go up there to Canada. It's maybe my second time in Canada ever. Uh, and Dudley is not well kept. Dudley, the star from childhood, is not well kept. He's in the corner. When I walk in, yeah, come in and see Dudley. When I walk in, <laughs> I, I have pictures. He's crumpled on the floor. Like I'm imagining, you know, I a display a on a mannequin yeah. standing up mannequin in a glass standing. case, like a Superman I, suit. Yeah. yeah. I walk in, you know, it's like a picture. I walk in, I'm at a lower angle. And then, and then you see Dudley like standing there lights around. That's not what happened. He's on there. And, and then they pull him up. Like you want a shoe pile. Uh, he went the way of yeah. most childhood stars, right? Yeah. yeah. So incredibly sad. And, but I got my moment with him. I got to take a picture with him. Somebody got in the suit. And then I got to get in the suit, um, which was interesting because, you know, they didn't work with a monitor. He worked out of the scrim of the neck. And I think the performer is smaller than I am because I was, like, crunched. And it's toasty. So all this toast oh. is falling down on me. It's slightly tight on my arm. But he had this mechanism in the hand that would work the eyelids. And I got to be... Dudley for that moment. And they were like, do, would you be interested in buying him? And I said, yes, yes, I would. How much? I don't know. We'll have to get back to you. What? How? Well, how about, how about this? No, that's not what we're thinking. Okay. How about, so there was a lot of negotiations. It never went to fruition. What ended up happening to Dudley is that he, he they, uh, the people who had him or have him captive, you can still find the post on Instagram. Uh, they started a clothing uh, company or store or shop in Canada, Mississauga, and he stands on the side of the road as like a roadside attraction, like come in to our clothing shop. With a person in it? No, no, no person. No, they find oh, they find no. the mannequin, or they might just use it crumpled. But I'm all I can imagine <laughs> is like you know the snow and slush going up. There's this one time you know we we had this plan. This is right around White Rabbit that we're working. I'm like, you guys live so close to Mississauga, guys. I'm gonna rent a truck, and all I have to do is get it across the border, and then like. All I have to do is get back across, and then it's mine. You know what? I feel like we were talking. We were talking about having me fix it up a little bit and yeah, stuff. Yeah, too. yeah that's yeah. right. It's yeah. all coming back to me now. Oh my gosh! Yeah. So it, it was made by a mascot company, and so what's interesting about the mascot? They had all these mascot techniques that are great for mascots, but not great for puppets. Um, on this costume puppet, so it was really interesting at the time. But I, I just remember watching Dudley. And thinking, I want to be Dudley. Like, I want to, like, I, I, I did the same thing with Bear in the Beautiful House. I want to exist in that space. Yeah. You did. Just, if only for a moment. For a moment. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, that is, uh, that's a crazy story. It is, it is a shame that uh, they didn't take you up on that offer because I'm sure it was very reasonable, especially considering right. the condition and considering what they ultimately ended up doing with it. I'm sure it didn't draw people in, you know, uh, you know <laughs> yeah. <it's> crumbled through <laughs> dragon. Come on in. This is the, this is the level of quality to expect, right? Oh my gosh. And it would have been beautiful in my closet at home. Yeah. Right. Actually, so what, what you may have used it as pajamas. 
<laughs> At yeah, least once so or twice. Had season one in a museum in Toronto, um, at like uh, like a I don't I don't know what their version of you know Toronto TV or whatever their like their BBC version of Toronto. Anyway, oh, they have CBC. Museum and you could oh CBC. So you, they had a CBC museum, and you could see the the polar bear, you know, from Sesame Street, all of those puppets, and the season one. Dudley the Dragon, but this was season two. Dudley the Dragon, so wow. Mark two, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, with wow. Big Bird technology. Yes, yeah. right, right, right. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and eyelids. I don't think the first one had eyelids, but the second season had. Had yeah, wow, wow. Yeah, that is. You're right. That kind of was a puppeteer's story, wasn't right. it? Right, yeah. it was. However, I'm sure you've got some. Uh, Another puppeteer story, like an on-set one. There's got to be something, right? So, uh, I, my on-set stories are not, you know, very long. Thank goodness. I feel like I talked a lot and told long stories that might not have gone anywhere. But the, uh, you know, the I was uh, working on. It was a Muppets Most Wanted day, and uh, we we're. I was. I got there early, like two hours early. So I told you, this is around the time where I'm like obnoxious. And nobody <laughs> wants a guest two hours early. I'm walking around the set and stuff. And I'm observing everything, taking in everything. Because there's like, you get no other time. Anyway, because I'm early, uh, Steve asks, hey, could you assist with the newsman for this bit? And it's the, you know, the bit where they're doing the bowls and stuff for Muppets Most Wanted. So I'm right-handing for him. And they have all these bulls coming in and Steve is like, okay, you know what? Don't worry. We're going to give you a Frank Oz special. Uh, and we're, we start the scene and we're working and then uh, everyone start, you know, take, take one. Everyone's stepping on my feet, like just step, st stepping, stomping <laughs> on my feet. <laughs> Take two, same thing. Like just like wow. just so, so you kept so your feet in the same I, I spot know. for the second take. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like they were finding his feet. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So it the Frank Oz special is is literally like just a hazing technique of people stepping on. I I uh, I guess I I I don't know. I never got it a second time, but yeah. it must be. There's a yeah. Wow. <laughs> Welcome to the group technique. Right. <laughs> or I thought that was pretty pretty cool. Yeah. Oh man. I was I was, I was pleased to have gotten the French. So, sure. No, of course. Yes. Of course. Yeah. That's uh, wild. Um I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> no regular sycophant. <laughs> yes. like, thank you. Please. Thank you. No more. Yeah. <laughs> three. Um yeah. That's good. That's good. Uh, and how how can people find out more about um, about you and the work that you guys are doing? Well, I I have uh, I I try to make it very easy. So I have chasewolner dot com and I have chasewolner on Instagram, chasewolner on Venmo. So, um, but we also have Busy Hand Studio Goods on Instagram, um, and it's Busy Hand Studio Goods because we make art supplies like. This is primarily what we make, these art palettes for artists. Uh, and then I also make some puppet kits and stuff. Um, and we're just starting to make a website for our busy hands. That's awesome. So. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll definitely, you know, have all those links in, in the show notes and, and everything else. And um, Chase, thank you so much for for joining us. It was so wonderful to, to catch up Thank with you, you and, and to share your work. Yeah, this is great, bud. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. This was so much fun. You know, we, we talk, oh, there's so many more things that we could talk about. I probably rambled too much about No, no, well, that's, well, well, that's all about one. I, again, yeah. Been a part of it's a perfect excuse to have you back on again. Definitely. Oh, perfect. And it won't, Maybe it I'll won't take it. 76 uh, episodes to get you, to get you back again. <laughs> no. So we promise, <laughs> <laughs> promise. <laughs> oh man. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity and, and, and hearing history stuff. I'd yeah. love to catch up again for the future. Well, this has been great. Chase Wollner, thank you so much for joining us on, on Puppeteers. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, bud. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 
We're at the end of another episode of Puppeteers, but the fun doesn't stop here. Visit Puppeteers.com for show notes and links to projects mentioned in this episode. Make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at PuppeteersPod, where we're posting new things every day. Puppeteers is edited by Matt Bowen and made possible thanks to viewers like you. If you enjoy this content, you can join our incredible Patreon patrons who are supporting the show for as little as $1 per episode. Those folks get access to early releases, uncut episodes, official Cup O tiers just like we use on the show, and can even submit interview questions for our guests. Go to patreon.com slash puppeteerspod to learn more. Another great way to support Puppeteers is rating and reviewing us on iTunes, leaving a comment or subscribing to this channel, or tell a friend about your favorite episode. Thanks again for joining us on Puppeteers Puppetry Shop Talk, in-depth interviews with the world's most passionate puppeteers. Hosted by me, Adam Krutinger. And me, Cameron Garrity. You know, I love the um, Michael Curry episode. That one. Yeah. <laughs> that episode's like pretty great yeah he, yeah, he was, was he was, he was so great. cool i, I wish one thing that i wish i didn't say though i just said it because i felt like i had to. what did you say that to stupid him? joke i said about halloween <laughs> and then he was like i don't remember what you like said that. about he halloween like well because he's talking about all these stuff things and i said all these big things he does he likes doing it for his home and stuff i said oh your house must be the best on halloween he just oh he says he some, says something like he's like Everybody says that. I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> I, I'm like, I wish I wasn't that guy. <laughs>